so I'm going to present to you today what I like to call the three R's in response to the changing times. The first R, you said, rediscover. Exactly. When we talk about redefining the church, we do not mean give it a new meaning. The meaning has already been given. Scripture teaches us what the church is, who the church is, what our task during these changing times when there's so much upheaval in our society, our task is to rediscover who the church is. And we can talk about who the church is by first identifying who the church is not. The church is not a political party, the church is not a personality, and the church is not popular opinion. But Jesus established the church in Matthew 16, 18, when he said, upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want to call our attention to rediscovering a Christ-centered church. You say it, Christ-centered church. Now, let me pause by say, saying that uh, the notion of the church, or in Greek, ekklesia, was not something new. This notion of an ecclesia started around the 5th century BCE, uh, or back in the days of Draco. Uh, in Athens, the bishop talked earlier about uh, Ephesus, but in Athens, uh, the gathering or uh, the gathering of a democracy was in what was called an ecclesia. And the word ecclesia means gathering, right? So it had its identity that was political, it was industrial, it was uh, also uh, uh, philosophical. So it became important when Jesus uses a term that people were familiar with in the first century that he defined what he meant by the term. He did not mean political aspirations of Athens, and he did not mean philosophical ideas of Epicurean and Stoicism, uh, which were the ruling philosophies of the time. He did not mean industrialization in the way that they understood it in those days. But Jesus was clear. He said, upon this rock I build my church, suggesting that Jesus redefined an already existing term in the Greco-Roman world. And when he redefines the term, he beckons attention to his definition by asking his disciples first, who do people say that I am? And they went down a list of prophets and, you know, I don't, and then Peter stood up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal it to you. Our father in heaven said, is upon this rock, I build my church. Now, there are two ways to understand that. Did he mean Peter, as in Petron, which his name means rock, Cephas? Did he mean what Paul said later when he said that uh, the church is built upon the foundations of the apostles and prophets? I want to bring you a little closer to the text and suggest that when Jesus says upon this rock, I build my church, he's speaking, here's another uh, term for you, epistemologically. Now, the word epistemology, episteme, means knowledge. Ology, again, is the understanding of the study of knowledge. So when we talk about epistemology, we're talking about upon this knowledge, upon this understanding, I build my church. And that knowledge and that understanding is Jesus. Many people go into ministry and they build organizations, but they don't build it as an organism because they understand organization, church growth strategies, but theological matters sometimes we don't quite grasp. The church is built upon the understanding and the knowledge of Jesus. Charisma can only take us so far. Jesus begins his ministry in Luke chapter number four, quoting from Isaiah who said, the spirit of the Lord, it's upon me because he's anointed me to do something and to say something. Leaders have to be prepared to do something and to say something. 
So here's another term, another Greek term I want to submit to you today, pneumatology. Now we talked about theology, epistemology, and now pneumatology. Pneumatology comes from two Greek words, pneuma and logos. Pneuma means, who knows, spirit. Pneumatology encountered Christology and something happened. We have what it takes when we have the spirit and we building it upon a knowledge of who Jesus is. What was the first R? The second R is recover. So we want to rediscover who the church is called to be, what the church is called to do, and now we want to recover something after we have rediscovered. And I'm going to pull on Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. for a very important reason. You know, in January, there's a federalized holiday in his honor. And I often call my students to attention that this is not acknowledgement of a president or political figure. Dr. Martin Luther King was a pastor, for God's sake. So we have a federalized Pastors Appreciation Day <laughs> for how he was able to take the spiritual and the existential and transform the mores of our society. It was a pastor who did it. Touch your neighbor and tell him. It was a pastor who did it. If you ever go to D.C. and you see the monument to his honor, he's the only pastor's monument that is in D.C. Repeat after me, a pastor did it. This is what he said from the, uh, the Birmingham jail in his letter from the Birmingham jail. There was a time when the church was very powerful. In the time when the early Christians rejoiced to be deemed worthy to do what? For what they believe. This is a challenge. People struggle with the idea of suffering for what we believe. We're not called to be popular. Uh, the church, in essence, is the continued presence of Christ in the world. The continued presence of Christ in the world. What does this mean for the 21st century? Christ's mission for the church. Church as the body of Christ is a way of becoming communion. Relational rather than simply description. In other words, here's another word, koinonia. Koinonia is ontological. Can I tell you what that means? Koinonia, fellowship, relationality, is ontological. Ontology means the, the understanding of being. So when I say koinonia is ontological, what I'm really saying is that fellowship is a way of being. It's not, a, not dinner after church and then going home. It can't merely be that. It can, that's included. But it means being together. Being together. If we're going to be Christ's presence in the world, there's only one Christ. And he said, Father, I pray that these be one as we are one. We have to be together. Right? That means we have to suffer together. We have to go through things together. We are the body of Christ united in the world. Now, the third R. So the first one was rediscover. The second one was recover. So we rediscover what? Who the church is. We recover what? The mission of the church. And we have to revolutionize the community for Christ. But we cannot re re uh, revolutionize the community if we don't have a sense of identity and if we don't have a sense of mission. Amen? And the church has its own politic that is defined by Christ, rooted in Christ, and it's, 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 it's made full at the cross. And by the cross, I mean the whole event, the death, burial, and resurrection. 
That's why Paul said, I just want to know him and the power of his resurrection. But I understand I can't know him in the resurrection if I don't know him in the fellowship. Oh God, I feel like preaching. <laughs> the fellowship of his suffering. The suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. And then he backs into the grave and said, and be conformed to his death. In order for us to be the church, some things got to die. Selfishness got to die. Wanting to be famous got to die. Wanting to be a superstar got to die. And then the fellow of his sufferings, meaning that I don't mind being persecuted to tell the truth whether they like it or not. Because uh, you, and this is oftentimes telling the students, so you may see the glory, but oh God, you don't know the story. I mean, listen, you're going to have to be committed if you're going to be part of the church for the 21st century. You see, they were small in number, but big in commitment. They were too God intoxicated. Too God intoxicated to be astronomically intimidated. By their effort and example, they brought an end to such ancient evils as infanticide and gladiatorial contests. We, the church, being the church, have an opportunity to bring an end to abortion. We, the church, have an opportunity to bring an end to racial bigotry. We have an opportunity to raise up people out of the community for the sake of the cross. We have an opportunity to bring down the problem of uh, suicide. We have an opportunity to raise up the uh, percentage of uh, young men who are graduating from high school and college. The church can do that. Repeat after me, the church can do that.